Hello and welcome to another of our month of Azure Databricks with Advancing Analytics. Today we're talking file formats. So whether you're just getting started with Databricks or you're planning out a huge enterprise data lake, it's going to be a big thing to choose the right format to store your data in. And there's a whole load of different choices. So we'll talk about some of the most common and why you should be using them and what you should be doing with your data. So where do we start? Everyone starts in the same place, the humble, the noble CSV format. Now, really quick to get started with, you can take an Excel file, save it as a CSV, throw it into a lake, and actually it'll work quite well. It'll automatically take a CSV file because it's serialized data. It means it can chunk it up into lots of different segments and read bunches of rows at a time, meaning you can get huge amounts of parallelism just from a CSV file. If it's compressed, it becomes single threaded, that's no good. But it has limitations. It can't take all data types. You can't have complex data types in there very, very nicely. So people then start to move on and think, well, what about something that can take complex data types? And you come across JSON files. So it can have more complex data in there. You can do a little bit more with a JSON file than you can with CSV. You need to be a little bit careful because you can serialize JSON. If you've got lots of separate JSON objects stored in a file, you can chunk it up and parallelize over it. But if your JSON file is stored as a single object that has tons and tons of child objects, be careful because you won't be able to serialize that across your different Databricks nodes. So JSON's good for some complex stuff, has some limitations, not incredibly optimized. Now, one of the slightly rarer ones that actually we keep coming across is one of the traditional big data types, Avro. Now this is still row based. So like CSV and JSON, all the whole row is stored, then the next row, then the next row. And it's actually quite good for high speed reading and writing. So if you're trying to get data into the lake really, really fast, if you're using something like Kafka, and you're trying to stream data down into a lake, Avro is quite a good file format for it, but it's not optimized for analytics. It's not very good at responding to huge, big batch aggregation queries. What is far better is Parquet, not the flooring. Now, this is a column store style file format. So if you're used to SQL Server, used to having a column store index, then this is essentially the same thing, but in flat file format. Now it does column under compression. It means you can say, select these columns and not these columns, and you don't have to read the columns that you're not after, which has a massive speed impact. It's not very good at small reads and writes. So if you're hammering small amounts of data into it, it's not gonna be great at that. You'll need to batch it up, but it's very, very common. Great, great, great for analytics queries. Now, if you're doing something slightly more advanced, then Databricks do have something called Delta, which is similar to Parquet. It's based on Parquet with a few little extra things. And it has some improved compression and it has file management over the top. So that problem where you're hammering small inserts into it, it'll go around and collect it and it'll clean those up for you and put some better compression in it. But it is only accessible through Databricks or something where you're using the data lake, the Delta Lake open source stuff. So be a little bit careful because it has some compatibility issues compared to some of the more common open source formats such as Parquet. All right, so let's have a look at how Parquet actually works. I've got a sample CSV file, lots of rows, lots of A's, A's, B's, C's, all my data, all held in different rows. When I compress that, there's a few things that happen. So in column one, because I've got some repeated rows, I've got a thing called run length encoding. So I can say, well, actually A is copied for the next three rows, so just do A times three. So I can actually store data without storing it for every row. I can say, this is gonna be the same for the next few rows. I've also got a dictionary. So that column three, instead of having Fred and Bob and Fred and Bob, I'm storing one, then two, and one, and two. I'm storing pointers to a dictionary file. So strings can get compressed really nicely in there as well. So both of these things, run length encoding, string compression, there's base encoding, there's various other compressions that go into there, which really help the way the Parquet compresses data. It gets really, really small. It has metadata built in to make it do that. So it needs to know what kind of data is held in each file so it can know what compression can do. And that means that actually it is a structured file type. So when I'm selecting from my Parquet, I don't need to tell it what the structure is going to be. It's not schema on read. It is actually a structured file type. So whenever you have Parquet, you have some metadata structures inside those files stored alongside it. Okay, so how do we actually access our Parquet? It couldn't be easier. It's baked into the Spark engine. So if I'm trying to create a data frame over some Parquet, I can go spark.read.parquet at this location in my lake, and that will bring the data and store it as a data frame. But then how do I get data stored? It's just as easy, if not easier. I can take my data frame, dot write, dot parquet, and give that location. Now on neither of those, I'm having to do anything to do with schema or structure. It's all baked into how the parquet engine actually works and it all passed that through itself. Could not be simpler. Okay, so don't forget to like and subscribe. Helps us keep doing this kind of thing and tune in next time. 
Thanks a lot.